What's up guys, welcome back to Barf Life Report. Today we're gonna be doing some spirits tasting. We're gonna be tasting some products from the Two James Distillery. And I wanted to say that this is not a sponsored video, but I did get these bottles from the distillery for free. Uh, I have been meaning to do a video about this for a long time because I've been a, such a big fan of Two James. Uh, I became aware of them when I was running the bar at Cole's French Dip and we got a bottle of Dr. Bird to taste. We absolutely loved it. I snapped it up for the bar immediately because it's just so good. Uh, and not only that, it was like 23 bucks a bottle and I was just floored by the price and the quality. It was amazing. Ever since then, I've just intended to taste more of their stuff and finally I got my hands on a bunch of their different spirits. So a little bit about Two James Distillery before we get to tasting. It was created by partners David Landrum, ba Peter Bailey, and Andrew Moore and is the first licensed distillery since Prohibition in Detroit. The whole kind of thrust of the distillery and what I really love about it is that they try to do things sustainably and they do things using all locally sourced ingredients, which kind of brings back the idea of terroir. And the, not a concept that you really hear about in the spirits industry very much. It's really much reserved for wine, but it does make a difference that when you locally source your ingredients and you use what's available, you tend to make a product that is more indicative of the place that it comes from. So the first thing we're going to taste is this Johnny's Smoking Gun, which is the distillery's homage to uh, Japanese whiskey. It is uh, made by using 70% seven-year corn whiskey and then 30% young rye whiskey. Uh, and then it gets a smoky character from a proprietary blend of Asian tea, which is interesting. It is uh, formulated according to the website to really complement the pork and fish broths that are very prevalent in Japanese cuisine. Um, so basically something you want to drink with your ramen, I would think. All right, let's give it a the old tasty poo. I love that sound. A little glick, 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 glick. So, smoky. And you get a lot of that really kind of bright corn. Maybe a little caramel, like a light hint of vanilla, maybe some pepper. But I like, you know, like a good amount of that smoke. It's got like a nice amber color. Ooh, very smooth, but very, very smoky on the, the palate. It's uh, 87 proof, so what is that? 43.5% alcohol by volume. It's got kind of a medium finish, but you know, there's almost something kind of watery. It's like really, you get that smoke character. It's not overwhelming, although it is the main flavor profile of the whiskey, and then you get a lot of that corn. Right? You get a little bit of that rye spice. A little bit of burn on the back palate. It's nice. It's like, like I would like to eat ramen and, and drink this. This is really, it's nice. It's really nice. Nice whiskey. I like it. What's a medium finish? What does that mean? Like the length of the finish. So basically you have like a short or medium or long finish uh, thinking about the length of flavor, right? So when you drink something, like for instance, when we were drinking scotch last week, those finishes means that the flavor uh, perpetuates itself on your palate for a either long amount of time or kind of a medium time or a kind of a short time. So like my big complaint about old, uh, the old Fitzgerald uh, bonded whiskey was that from the, the bottles that we have at Kohl's, they were a very short finish. So you get like a nice, you know, kind of proofy kind of front end of flavor, but then it just devolves to nothing very quickly as opposed to something that just goes on and on and on, you know? Um, I don't know. I kind of, I feel like I talked about that way too long, but that's, that's what it is. I just think I said the same thing twice. All right. Rating time. So Marius and I established kind of this arbitrary sort of rating system that we do for every bottle from now. Like we're establishing it now, right? So, yeah. uh, it's just basically, um, 10 different categories uh, that rate to 100. So it's just like 10 points each category. And um, not since I'm not like a whiskey aficionado, it's not going to be like color, palette, finish. We're not doing that. We're doing this on sort of like, a, well, you'll see. You'll see. So let's just get into it. It's, right. it's not on like Doug DeMuro's weekend score. Right. For those in the know. For those that you guys know what he's talking about. All right. So first category is value. Value. Uh, okay. So... In the $35 to $45 price range, although I have seen it listed at $48 and 
I think it is a pretty good value for what it is, especially in the 35, like what, like toward the 35 scale. Anything above $45, I think would be a little bit pricey, but since you can get it for under that, I think it's a pretty good value. So I'm gonna give it a, let's say a six. We'll give it a six. Six out of 10. Which is funny because you say that all of my ratings rate to six. Six, so. six and sevens, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, next one is availability. So this is a local product uh, in Detroit, Michigan. And although their rum, uh, the Dr. Bird, is widely available in the United States, uh, I don't think that many of these are ava like that available. Uh, I haven't actually tried to order any of these bottles from the distillery itself to California, so I'm not sure if it's available to us. Uh, I'm going to give it like a four for availability uh, because it's a little bit problematic to get, I think. Okay, next one is cocktail. Cocktail viability. viability. So, okay, so this is a very viable for a cocktail. Um, there is this idea that people have that very flavor, f flavorfully nuanced, does that make sense? Like things that are very nuanced in their flavor profiles should never be used in cocktails. That's why there's like this whole idea that like single malt scotch shouldn't be used in cocktails. And I just don't agree with that. That said, this is basically a high corn whiskey that tastes like smoky corn whiskey to me. Uh, and as a result of that, there's only two or three major flavor profiles working in this whiskey. And so I think that it would be very viable for cocktails because you can take one of those notes like the smokiness and then you can like play that into cocktails, adding different flavor profiles from other liqueurs or juices and things. So I give it a seven or eight. Now we'll stick with eight for cocktail viability. Okay, wow, it's pretty high. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very good whiskey, I like it. All right, branding. Oh, I mean, this is something that I've been, I mean, this is, okay, so we have two different categories. We have branding and we have fun factor, right? And I think that the branding and the fun factor kind of go hand in hand with this particular bottle. Um, I think the branding is really fantastic. You know, I, it, it, it kind of reminds me of the Japanese spaghetti Western, Sukiyaki Western Django, which is a Takashi Miike film starring Quentin Tarantino. It reminds me of that sort of like Japanese, Japanese culture, spaghetti Western, Wu-Tang Clan kind of thing. I, I'm gonna give this a, I'm gonna give this a 10 in branding. Okay. And then fun factor, I'm, I'm gonna give it like a 10 oh, in fun we're, factor. We're jumping ahead on categories, okay. I, well, I, I had already mentioned it when I, cause I said fun fact, we have two fun so, factor so and. 10 in fun factor, okay. 10 uh, in, so 10 and 10. And then the bottle design is. Uh... <sighs> okay, so the bottle design here is interesting. Uh, I like some of the things that they do with it, especially they have this like flourish of the coin on here. Uh, but I don't think, I, I think that like for sitting on your shelf, it's very nice, but for bar use, it's a little heavy. It's a little clunky. It's not something that like, if you're making cocktails, you really want to be grabbing this thing. It's like really kind of, it's not very like ergonomic. Is that like a good word to describe? You know, you were even saying that it seemed like a bottle that's made to sort of sit on your shelf. Yeah. And then sort of you pour it into a Glen Cairn and, and, uh, and, uh. You know, it it was designed for somebody to think, oh, this is a pretty bottle. Right, or for like one. a back bar, but it's it's definitely, it's not priced for a well spirit, I wouldn't think. I don't know what the wholesale price on it is, but I wouldn't think that it's priced for a, a well spirit. That being said, like this in the well, like if you were going to put this in the well, it would be very problematic. So I would say for bottle design, I'll give it a, I'll give it a five for bottle design because it's, it's a nice bottle. It's just, you know, and I, I think it's unfair to rate something on bottle design just for its viability in the bar, okay, you know. All right, then the uh, the story of the the brand or the distillery or the whole. You know, I, I want to give this like a six or a seven because I do like the story of the brand. You know, it's from this historic neighborhood, Corktown in Detroit. You know, which kind of plays into the history of the Irish potato famine in the 1840s and how Irish immigrants kind of came, flooded in into this neighborhood. And then, you know, named after count, it's named after County Cork in Ireland. And then also the story just behind that the, you know, founder is a native of Detroit, I believe. And like he lives in Detroit, obviously, he's got a distillery there. But then also he, he like wants to use uh, locally sourced ingredients and, and, uh, and, and really kind of play with the idea of terroir, right? And make a very, 
like a product that's distinctive of the place that it comes from. And I really like that idea. I think that's a great story. Story is really important for brands because story is what sells your brand. If your brand has a great story, it's gonna sell. And that's why things like Campari and Chartreuse and you know, they become these iconic brands because of their story, right? So I think it's a very important thing. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I'll say seven for, for story because I think it is a good story. It's something that's nice to recount to people, you know, when you present them with the product, so. All right, overall and category. I mean, this is a tough one because this is a, a category in and of itself. Uh, really, you know, it's like American whiskey made to taste indicative of or an homage to Japanese whiskey. There's only two distilleries that I know that are doing anything similar to this, which is obviously Two James and then St. George, but the St. George Japanese style whiskeys that they make, I've never tried them. So I don't, I don't know how to rate this as far as like category, especially because this is very much a, it's like very much a corn whiskey. You get a little bit of the spiciness of the rye. It's very smoky from that tea, well, you know? Let's give it a neutral five then, I guess. Yeah, okay. I'll give it a neutral five for category just because, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't fit into any specific large category. Right. Uh, and um, the, the workhorse category that we... Uh... Ah, this is not a workhorse spirit. I wouldn't, it's not something that I think that we're going to be going to time and time and time again. If I were making cocktails with this, it would be a very specific idea in mind. So for instance, that whiskey sour that we did a while ago on Barfly that was um, inspired by Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where I used a smoked tea mm -hmm. at, for like a, because uh, we were challenged by Truffles on the Rocks to make something that was smoky and I used smoked tea as opposed to smoking the cocktail with smoke. This would have been a fantastic whiskey to use in that and really play up that smoke. And even that corn to go with all of the other flavor profiles of the whiskey sour. Uh, we didn't use it. We didn't have a bottle at that time. Uh, but it's something that I guess the reason why I, I, I told that story is because I think this is something that we would use in a very specific way, but not go back to again and again and again uh, on the channel. So I would give it probably like a three as far as like workhorseness. 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 Okay. Three. And then personal taste preference, like per personal, what do we call it? Category? Uh, personal taste rating? My personal taste rating, I, I don't know. I want to give this like a five, like a really middle of the road. And the reason why is because I, I don't really, there are some corn whiskeys that I like, but I don't really gravitate to corn whiskey specifically. Uh -huh. So, and this is very much like the first thing that you taste is the smoke. The second thing that you taste is the corn. And then you've got the back palate spice of the proof and then the rye as well. So I'm going to give this like a neutral five because I like it a lot. It's a product that I'll, I will, I will definitely drink through this bottle over time. I'll d drink through it. I like it, but it's not something uh, that it, I would necessarily naturally gravitate toward. Okay, so that gives it a a score of sixty three out of hundred. Sixty three out of hundred is not too bad. That's no, actually, it's a that's a six. It's a six, <laughs> <laughs> just like you said. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> 